In this video, I'm going to give you the highest yield tips for scoring highly in section one of the BMAT. Welcome back. If you're sitting the BMAT, this video is going to serve as the kind of greatest hits for tips to score highly. We're gonna go through a bit of the basics, then we're gonna talk about tips, and actually we're gonna have three questions that we're gonna go through for you to attempt, and then I'm gonna walk you through the answers and how you should think about them. We'll start by kind of looking at really valuable resources, then we want to look at things in terms of skills and those skills that you need to make sure that you're practicing, honing, and kind of getting just right to score highly, and then we'll actually put those into action by going through some questions. So just to recap, section one, is one hour, so that's exactly half of the BMAT. That comprises of 32 questions, which are all going to be multiple choice, and that allows you 112 seconds per question. Remember my biggest tip, which is use the Cambridge Thinking Skills Assessment Test. They have loads of past papers, which are there for the humanities people who are applying to things like history, and they are critical thinking questions. So you can use the TSA as your practice questions, and then to really test yourself, use the precious limited amount of past BMAT papers that you have available to you. One of the things that I recommend most highly is that you look up some resources for critical thinking. So if you want to check out my online course, I have a BMAT course dedicated to teaching you all the skills that you need to score highly, so you can check that out there. Otherwise, anything online that you can find that teaches you the critical skills thinking principles. And just to remember, scores-wise, if you're applying to the London universities, you should be aiming for 4.1 in section one, or if you're applying to Oxbridge, at least a six. But really, you shouldn't be thinking about those things because the maximum score is nine, and you should really be aiming to get as high as you possibly can in this section. So the way that I want you to think about your preparation for the BMAT is in skills. What you don't wanna do is just go through practice questions and be like, yes, got it right, got it wrong. I want you to look at each question after you've attempted it and think, what skill is this testing? So then you can really work out uh, what skills I'm good at and what skills do I need to practice more of to make sure that I'm strong enough to score highly in the BMAT. So the skills that you need to monitor your progress on are general problem solving, understanding arguments, verbal skills, mathematics, data interpretation, and spatial awareness. And all of these, as I say, are tested in the TSA, so that is why you should use those papers as your practice questions. So those 32 questions are gonna be divided evenly in between the spatial and the logical types of questions. So you can think of those as either problem solving or critical thinking, and we're gonna take each of those sections and divide them up now and do some practice questions in each. So first we'll look at problem solving, and remember that this is 16 questions so half of section one. And here, they want to see your ability to think on the spot and solve problems with mathsy type situations. And from the BMAT site, there are certain types of questions that are gonna come up, which I'll read to you now. But remember, this is just gonna serve more as a point of reference for you to identify what sections you're good at and which ones need practice. So these types of questions that come up for the problem solving section are spatial reasoning, speed, distance, and time questions, table with missing parts, logic, sequences, alphabet questions, all that kind of thing. So now that you know roughly what areas you need to focus on and make sure that you're not weak in any of them, let's have a look at a question where I'm gonna give you two minutes. I'm gonna put the question on now. I'll do the timing for you, so don't worry about pausing the video. We'll go two minutes, give you plenty of time to do it. Have a go now, and then we'll go through the answers after.
I hope you found that question okay and manageable. Actually, as I was going through the answers of this, I found that there's actually a mistake on this. So I added my own. You can choose one or more because it says one of them is incorrect, which actually isn't. So let's go through it and I'll talk you through the answers. So the first stage with this is that we have to work out which dice is which, right? So we know that what which die is which, should I say? So we know that one of them opposite sides will always add up to nine and the other the opposite sides will always add up to five right so the first thing that i noticed is that well you've got a five and a four here which to add up to nine these must be on opposite sides right so this can't be the nine die so this has to be the five die so um so one die is always nine so that must be this one because the number four needs to be on this invisible bottom side here that you can't see uh, because otherwise that just wouldn't make sense because this has to be the five die where the invisible side here is zero, the invisible side on here is one and the invisible side of this uh, opposite to this two is three. And I'll show you that illustrated here. Um, so that's just confirming which is which. But then that's how we work out what are the numbers that we can't see so obviously we can see the four which has to have an opposing one we can see the five which has to have an opposing zero we can see the two which has to have an opposing three and then for them all to add up to nine we've got the same here so five must have a corresponding four uh, two must have a corresponding seven remember that it's an unusual die in that it's not a normal one to six die and then for the three that we can see here we have to have a six right so but that's the first stage. We need to know, like I say, from this question, we need to know which die is which, so what we're dealing with, and then we can work it out. So then I've, I've just rearranged the question so that you can see all the kind of question die, and we have to work it out from there. So the first one we can take straight away, and we know that this isn't going to be right. And the reason that we know that this isn't going to be right is because it has a six so that means it can't be the five die of course and then of course if you have a six then the opposing side needs to be a three and we can see the threes therefore that can't be the opposing side and that means that it has to be incorrect now b isn't so much that it's more tricky but we have to start using our visualization kind of rotating this in our head to work out what's what so firstly we, we have to work out which one it belongs to right so we can kind of almost immediately say that it must belong to the nine die because if you look here, the three to be a part of the, to be the five die would have to be uh, have, have a two on the opposing side. And a neat little trick that I can do here is to start rotating it so you can visualize yourself what I'm doing in my head. Right, so we can rotate this die to show you so if the three is there and the two is there, well then this can't be the same die because of course then the four, this would have to be a four and it's not. Therefore, we can straight away write off that this is not the right one, okay? So we can rule that one out. So first we have to work out whether C is the nine die or the five die. And the way that we can work that out is that you can imagine if this was flipped this way around and the one was the invisible side then you couldn't have the two on the other side because that wouldn't add it up to nine and therefore this has to be the five die then we need to work out well can can this be the, can this be correct so let's take our five die and let's rotate it to how it looks here so now that we have our die rotated we can see we have the five on the side where it needs to be and really all we need to do is so we need to imagine that the five here the opposite side is the zero but if we're just rotating this five this die along its axis we can see that it, you could feasibly if you turned it 90 degrees this way and then 90 degrees again so that this two is on the bottom and this four is on the other side that that would mean that the corresponding three could be on this bottom side and the corresponding one could be on the opposite side to that and you're just kind of twisting it um, with the five staying where it is but twisting it in a way um, 
in a kind of anti-clockwise way that's showing you all the numbers that are on that side. So that could work. So that means that C is actually correct. Now the next one um, is a funny one because in the original question that I found on, uh, on, on Google, this said that this wasn't correct. But let me show you why this is correct. So straight away, we know that D is belonging to the nine die family, but does it work with the current die or do we have to do anything to make this visible that it, that it works? So let's rotate it back into a format where we can see it. Now, a similar sort of thing. If we were to rotate this die 90 degrees this way, could this work? Because for this to work, as we rotate it 90 degrees one way, then the two could be on the top, the five could stay where it is. So we can't replicate that, but you can imagine if we were turning this 90 degrees that way, this three would go over the edge, this two would go where the three currently is, and then we would expose a number here. Now, if that were to be a six, then that would mean that the three and the six have opposing ones, which add up to nine. The two would then require a seven here. We don't, we can't see that, but we can imagine that the seven is there. And then the four, could be on this other invisible side, the back side that we can't see. So that is why, although they said on their question that it can't work, this actually can work. This is a this is a possible one that works, okay? And then finally we have E. Now, why does E not work? Let's have a look. Now we can tell right away that E has to belong to the five die because um, you need if, if anything that has a five would need to have a four opposing it to add up to nine. Therefore, it doesn't have that, so it can't. So that would mean that we need this five die here to have. So let's orientate what we do have. So this is, you know, as I was saying, this is what you're doing in your head. This is what you're working out as we go along to you kind of visualizing rotating this, right? And you can see by rotating it now, of course, we would need to have a zero on the opposite side to this five, a three on the opposite side here. But we can see that in this orientation, the, the, the two things don't match. So now we've rotated them to be in the exact same lie. And then the five and the four are the same. Therefore, the top should match. And obviously, because they don't, there's a two and a three. And that makes it so that that one is not the right answer. So they're actually, like I say, despite what they said in those questions, there's, there are actually two answers there and you can see when we kind of work through them and spatially orientate them you can see why that's the case so I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, while we've got some slides prepared I might as well take you through these uh, so type special question you'll either have visualization construction and deconstruction or navigation so with these die ones you can I mean people talk about recommending you can tear the paper up and build the die yourselves if you want um if, i don't know how quickly you can do that i think it, i don't think you've got in the 112 seconds i don't know if you've got the time to do it but you can visualize it and you can try and draw them out in a way that um you can kind of understand the orientation i think doing this little it's almost like a compass isn't it um a kind of die compass might put you in a good position just to quickly understand everything that's going on um but yeah if you can do it in your head then obviously that makes things a lot quicker um then so there's also navigation one so visualization just like i say imagine you have to imagine the shapes rotate them in your head get used to kind of that kind of in mind engineering um then to how you approach these questions so construct and deconstruct the shapes uh, okay, apply the visualization, as I said, the best method. Uh, so imagine the original shape in three dimensions, rotate it, then go to the option, the first option as we did, work out whether it works or not, and if it doesn't, and then just go through the rest and see how that works and, and kind of apply the same rotation and visualization in your head and see if um, it fits. And if it does, then great. And if not, move on to the next one. So just to summarize, there are three question types and we talked about those. Um, some of the questions combine different bits and different skills, definitely construction, deconstruction and visualization with this. And finally, just remember to be smart with your time management for these. It's really important that you don't get caught up on a question. If it's too long, just be ruthless with it and uh, just flag it, move on, have a guess. There's no negative marking and then come back to it if you've got a bit more time at the end. 
So I hope you can see from that question how rotating things in your head and really picturing how the objects move in space is really gonna help you visualize how to kind of go about them and get the right answer. Another common type of question that you get for these spatial type ones is where you have objects stacked and then you can see them from only the direct in front view so you don't get a 3D representation of what it is. You might just get a 2D representation of a 3D thing. And the important thing to realize with that is that objects don't float. So for example, you might have a stairway of blocks and you, they're gonna ask you how many blocks are in that stairway. And you'll only be able to see the first one for the, for the front row, for the next row, you'll only be able to see the second one poking through above that as if you were climbing a stairway, you can only see the step. And then the one after that, you'll see the third one up because the two and the one are hidden. So it's really important to kind of understand as if you're looking at a stairway straight on, things don't float. There's something underneath that that's supporting that. So those are the kind of questions that trip people up on the spatial. So building blocks, asking you how many blocks make up that section. So for those types of questions, remembering simple things like your physics where objects don't float and it's just about visualizing it three dimensionally. So for that type of question, just build the 3D image in your head, work out what's supporting the objects that you can see. Remember that there are some invisible cubes there that you have to kind of imagine and count in your total cube count. And then you just work out the columns and the rows and then add them up. Okay, so now we're gonna attempt another question. I'm gonna give you two minutes, same as normal, and I will put the question on the screen for you. Don't worry, I will keep the timing. This one is going to be a bit of a mathsy type question for you to work out. So we'll start in three, two, one, and I'll see you after. Okay, so well done for having a go at that. Um, let's go through the answer. So what we've given here is four people and their birthdays as a kind of a number of the day in the year in which they appear. And what they're asking you to do is find out which ones, which of the two will have the same day of the week in which their birthday lands. Right, so before we even think about this, what's the way that we do this? Well, if somebody has the same day of the week for their birthday, then their difference between their birthdays between these numbers is going to be a multiple of seven so essentially all we need to do is find out quickly in our heads which of these is a multiple of seven as the the difference between the two <coughs> so we can do some quick maths to subtract and, and then divide by seven and we can see that that so from the 10th to the 114th that's not a gap divisible by seven from the 10th to the 166th is not a gap divisible by 7, so uh, 156, which is not, um, and, and, and 104, which is not. But if we do 1, uh, so 213 minus 10, that's 203. Think of it as 210 is 
30 times 7. So this is 29 divided by 7. So let's have a look. Uh, I've just written it out on a slide here. So find the so exactly find the pair where the difference is the multiple of seven. So twenty uh, two hundred and thirteen minus ten is two hundred three divided by seven is twenty nine. So that means that um, so the first and the fourth. So Joanna and Abhishek are the correct ones. So that's fairly easy once you know how to do it. So I hope that helps you understand how you're going to go about these types of maths questions. Just being intelligent about working out what the quickest way to work out what you need to know is and then going about it. But I have three tips for you for the maths questions that are going to help you improve your score and your speed. The first is that your mental arithmetic, same as when you're preparing for the quantitative reasoning of the UCAT, is absolutely key. The faster and more confidence you can have in your maths, the better you will do. And if you want to work out how to multiply and divide large numbers, there are plenty of YouTube videos that I can recommend that are going to help you learn that really quickly. And I would recommend that you do those things like improving your arithmetic because here you don't don't have a calculator to use for the BMAT. The second is that it's really vital that you take a moment to just work out what's going on. Before you dive in and do loads of calculations, it's really important just to take a step back, work out what is it I need to know, and then just be really focused on where you place your energy in calculating stuff. And the third and most important one is to remember that questions might not repeat, but skills do. So as I said before, just make sure that you're aware of what skills you're good at and not so good at so that you can strengthen your skills in those areas to make sure that you're kind of even across the board when scoring highly in this. And remember that for the BMAT you don't have a calculator, so the better your mental arithmetic, the easier it will be. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of section one, which is critical thinking. That again is another 50%, so another 16 questions of the BMAT. And it's basically a test of how well you understand arguments. So I'm gonna read an excerpt to you from the BMAT themselves. They say, the skill of critical thinking is essential for many areas of academic study and often involves considering an argument put forward to promote or defend a particular point of view. Whatever the subject of study, it is necessary to understand the argument presented by others and to be able to assess whether the arguments establish their claims. So again, we want to think of this in terms of skills and the skills that BMAT say they test are summarizing conclusions, drawing conclusions, identifying assumptions, assessing the impact of additional evidence, detecting reasoning errors, matching arguments and applying principles. So lo and behold, the types of questions that you're gonna get are on conclusions, assumptions, flawed arguments, strengthening points, weakening points, and reasoning errors. And the way that these argument questions will typically go is that you'll have a passage of anything from 100 to 150 words, then you'll have a question about the passage, and then you'll have usually five answer options to choose from. It's not always necessarily that amount, but typically about five is the standard. And what they're testing is your basic understanding of critical thinking concepts and arguments. And they want to test your interpretation of that and then your ability to draw conclusions. But really the most important thing is to kind of identify and not get swayed by things that are assumptions. So if you've seen my videos on the verbal reasoning, you're going to see the structure that I use of REEFs that's going to help you identify arguments. So REEF stands for, firstly, relevance. Is it directly connected to the subject matter? Evidence, is there any proof or is it relying on assumptions? Emotional, so no personal or subjective opinions are in there. Then is it factual, so do they have any statistics or real hard facts that they can fact that up with? And then finally, is it sensible? Are they saying something absolutely ridiculous based on the text? or is it something that's very plausible? Sometimes you have to use that thing of, does it logically follow? If something does logically follow, then it's a strong argument. However, if it doesn't, and they're kind of making assumptions, then they're making a leap, and that weakens the argument, therefore making it less likely to be the best or most correct answer. So now we're gonna jump in and have a look at a critical thinking question. I'm gonna put it on the screen. I'm gonna keep the time for you for another two minutes, and then we'll go through the answers after. So get ready, three, two, one, go.
So well done for having a go at this third and final question of the video. I'll talk you through it and kind of explain how we go about the answer. So let's just read it out first. In the UK in the 1990s, there was an outbreak of the brain disease, creutzfeldt jakob disease, which caused uh, by eating beef from cattle infected with the disease bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, so the type of meat thought to be infected was taken out of the food chain in 1989 and cases of creutzfeldt jakob uh, have been declining since 2000. Susceptibility to CJD is associated with two variants in a gene, M and V. We can inherit three possible combinations, MM, MV, and VV. Until last year, all 170 people diagnosed with the disease in the UK had the MM combination. Recently, someone who had the MV combination has died of the disease. In the UK, 38% of people People have the MM combination and 51% uh, have the MV combination. So what conclusions are we going to draw from this? So before we go through the possible answers, let's just have a look first at kind of what we've decided. So we're told here that a CJD is a brain disease called by, caused by infected beef, that cows that had it have been taken out of the food chain, so then they're not around anymore. Um, the gene to do with it has three possible combinations and everyone who died of it um, until last year had the MM variant. So this is going to be the one that's, that's uh, most likely to kill people. And we've got to be careful about what we can infer from that. Um, one person, However, one person died with the MV variant, 38 of the population has the MM and 51% uh, has the MV variant. Okay, so... The way that we do this is we just take this one answer at a time. So what I'm going to do is go through A first. So 11% of the people in the UK are not susceptible to CJD. So um, we have the 38% here of the MM, which we're told is the bad one. The other one, which one person has died from, is not as bad. That's 31. So obviously the difference here is 11%. We've got to be careful about making assumptions that just because someone's got the, the VV combination means that they are not susceptible. Very So just because kind of absence of absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence, right? Those those are not the same things. So the option um, is concluding that the VV variant makes you immune to CJD. This is incorrect, of course. Um, it's making a lot of assumptions. There's no evidence to suggest that VV are immune. It just just because no one has died, um, it doesn't kind of make you uh, in impervious to CJD. Okay. So again, yeah. And when we look at this rationally, it's a very small sample size, um, and it's taken a long time for um, the MV variant to cause a death. So you're not sure so we're making a big assumption by selecting this one now i'll come to the, i'm going to be last dead giveaway as to <laughs> which one is the correct answer but let's have a look at c first eating infected beef does not cause cjd in everyone with the mm combination again this is again making an assumption you cannot draw that conclusion so again only 177 people have died uh, mm is really common um so, so we have to be very careful here with what we infer. In all likelihood, this is probably true. However, we can't... So, Because what it's saying here that lots of people had the MM combination and of those that died, the MM combination was the most prevalent. Pretty much all, all the ones that died had the MM combination. But in reality, the truth is that you probably can assume that a lot of people had the MM combination and didn't die from it. But um, you can't assume that. We don't know and we don't have the data to say how many people actually ate. We, we literally cannot make that assumption without what, what, just from what is said to us in the, in the passage here. And that's the important thing. Be, be careful of common sense versus making assumptions uh, and versus what you're explicitly told in the passage. So D, around half of the UK population is at risk of developing CJD in the future. Well, this is... Again, similar to C, it's we know that 50% have the gene, that 50% of the population have the gene that make them susceptible to CJD if they were to eat the meat. However, this is assuming that 100% of the UK population ate the meat for the 50% or so to 
a kind of be susceptible. Obviously, you might have a susceptible gene, but you have to actually ingest the meat that's going to kind of set that cascade off to cause the disease that is actually going to put you at risk, right? If you don't, if you if you're a vegetarian, it doesn't matter whether you're susceptible and you don't eat and you don't eat the meat, then you are not at risk. So that's an important assumption to be careful of. Okay, and I mean this is kind of the inverse of this, right? So here we're assuming that. Uh, everybody's eating beef, whereas here we can't assume that everybody's eating beef. So we, we can't assume that um, the numbers are just the hundred and seven. Well, that more people than the hundred and seventy seven have eaten the beef, right? So that brings us on to the correct answer, which is B. So having one V variant of the gene does not guarantee resistance to CJD. This is correct because really, what the information that's given in the passage, only one person with MV has died, um, therefore. It does not guarantee resistance, right? Having one variant of the gene does not guarantee resistance to CJD because we've got evidence of that with this person that has died. Where is it here? So person with the MV um, combination has died of disease. So here we've got one bit of proof here that has completely refuted any suspicion that the V is in some way uh, protective. Uh, and that's with that one case where someone has died. So I hope that's helped you kind of understand where conclusions can be drawn from text and that sort of thing. So when we think of an argument, what we need to think of is premises. So those are statements that are made or prepositions, and we base our conclusions on those. So the premises lead to conclusions. However, if a conclusion is reached without a set of premises or without a strong premise, then we're making an assumption. So the next bit we're going to talk about is the deductive reasoning. And that's usually typically the hardest part of the BMAT. So you need to think of this a bit like a Sudoku, where as you're adding one bit of information that you've deduced from other bits, then you learn a bit more, then that helps you work out the next thing, and then you're kind of going to add in more and more bits of information as you're piecing things together. So I'm going to give you five tips to help you with the deductive reasoning section. And then if you want to learn a little bit more about deductive reasoning and how to score highly in it, you can check out my online course there where we go through it in a bit more depth. So the temptation here is to dive straight in and read the questions and kind of try and work it out all straight away. But actually what you need to do is read through the, the information that's given to you and go through it systematically, completing what you understand as you go along. So the second tip is to start with this, kind of start piecing the puzzle together and don't look at the question just yet. Number three is to fill in the information as you go. So the best thing might be to draw a table or build a grid or something that's going to kind of step by step sketch out the information that you're being presented in a kind of visual representation. Number four is that you might not be able to immediately suss out the correct answer. But what you need to do is as you're adding more and more information, then you can kind of go through the answer options. And as you're working things out, you can deduce the ones that aren't correct and eliminate those and then kind of systematically work through them to work out which fits with the information that's been given to you. Number five is make sure you work out what you actually need to work out first. Sometimes once you've got a bit further down and you need to work out exactly what it is you need to know. You can have a look at the answer options to make sure that you're not doing any unnecessary calculations. This is very similar to how I teach the decision making section where I say understand what it is you need to work out or what you need to know before you start diving in and doing loads of calculations. Okay so now that we've looked at both parts of the section one I'm going to give you my top tips for this whole section and kind of divide them by each of those parts. My first tip for the problem solving is be careful how you handle the data. So instead of just diving straight in and doing the calculations make sure you understand what's being presented to you before you go straight in. I also mean here that make sure you're not making assumptions about the data. One of the classic mistakes that people make is that, say for example, you're given a scenario where you're baking a cake for four other people. People uh, kind of go and calculate the recipe for four people in total, where actually you need to realize that you're included in that four, and it's actually a recipe for five. The second thing for the problem solving is to use as many shortcuts as you can. This is usually by having really good math skills and good arithmetic. You can do the quick equations or the quick calculations to get through things a lot faster, and that helps you save time and kind of focus more energy on the big picture and understanding the logic of what you're doing rather than getting bogged down with the maths. And my third tip is similar to the maths thing. If you understand probability calculations, that will help save a lot of time because here when you have two things going on at the same time, you can work out simultaneous probabilities by knowing those equations really well. And my final tip for the problem solving is that make sure you take that moment to understand the data, work out what's being presented and asked of you before you start to manipulate it and start diving in with doing some equations. And 
again, if you're struggling with that sort of thing, my online course covers all of that material for you. Then for the critical thinking, I would say that the most important things are number one, make sure that you understand the elements of an argument. So as I said before, reefs is the way to understand those best. And if there's a missing link that doesn't follow between a premise and a conclusion, that is where the assumption lies. Number two, remember that premises strengthen arguments and assumptions are just invisible premises. So make sure you don't get caught out by when people are making a leap and there's no backing or kind of evidence to kind of go from one thing to another. It doesn't logically follow, so to speak. Then apart from the deductive reasoning type questions where we've given a slightly different way of doing it, I would say that the best order is to read the question, then read the passage and then attempt the answers. And then of course, like any exam bit of advice, make sure that you're very present and you're understanding what's going on by reading the question carefully. And just be careful of theories or things that are deemed definitive when they're not necessarily so. For example, they might say that um, there's a lower incidence of bowel cancer in France and they drink more wine in France. Therefore, does wine drinking cause a reduction in bowel cancer? Well, there's maybe a theory that that is the case, but there's no without proof and evidence that that is true, then you can't say that for sure. Because otherwise, unless we've proven specifically and explicitly that drinking wine reduces bowel cancer, then we're making an assumption and a leap based on the data. So finally, just look out for these bold statements like need, must, never, always. These are the kind of things that ring alarm bells when people write them in questions or in some of the answer options because they kind of almost are a trap to make you fall into these strongly worded statements. So if you want some more help with the BMAT, you might wanna check out this playlist here where I've done some more high yield tips for all the other sections as well as some practice questions for all different types. And then if you want a really good resource for how to prepare, I recommend you check out this video here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in one of those videos.